Namaste everyone. My name is Vishali Shah. I welcome each one of you to our session on Hindu culture and lifestyle. You are watching us live on hinduscriptures.com uh, Facebook page. You will get to see this video tomorrow on Hindu Scriptures uh, YouTube channel as well. So today we have a very interesting topic with someone who's uh, very senior in his uh, domain and someone who has done research for many, many years uh, on the on various topics, on various scriptures as well. So, uh, Bharat Gupta Ji, Namaste, Namaste, how are you? Namaskar. You are in our session. Thank you. Uh, Bharat Ji, we, before we start our session, we always start with a, uh, any Vedic prayer. So, I would like to request you to say a prayer and then we will start. Very good. I thank you for inviting me. And I start with the famous Vedic mantra Indram Mitram Varuna Magne Maho Ratho Divyaha Sasuparno Garutman Ekam Sat Vipra Bahudha Vadantya Magnim Yamam Mata Rishwana Maho. So it says that Indra Mitra Varuna Agne and the divine Garutuman, who is also called Suparana, they, along with Agni, Yam and Matarishwan, are in different names, but they are one. The wise have known the truth by many names. So this is the most famous verse from the 10th mandala of the Rig Veda. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bharaji, before we, before we start our session, I would like to read your introduction to our audience so that they know uh, who you are in, in brief. Professor Bharat Guptaji is a retired professor from the University of Delhi, is a, a classicist, theater, uh, theater artist, sitar and surbandar, surbahar player, uh, musicologist, cultural analyst and newspaper columnist. He has expounded extin uh, extensively on classical Indian Sanskrit texts, including the Dharma Shastras and the need to include arts in modern curriculum. Apart from his degrees uh, from premium institu institutions in the country and from North America, he has studied in the traditional style, the classical Indian text from famous gurus. He was trained in sitar by Pandit Uma Shankar Mishraji and was taught the classical text by Swami Kripal Vanda, Vananandaji and Acharya Brihaspati ji. For more than 35 years, he has lectured extensively at universities in India, North America, Europe and Greece uh, on Indian music and theater, theater theories and taught courses on uh, these subjects there. His major published books include uh, Dramatic Concepts, Greek and Indian, 1994, 96, 2006, 2012, 2016, Nash Natya Shastra, Chapter 28, Ancient Scales of Indian Music, 1996, 12 Greek Poems in Hindi, 2001, India, A Cultural Decline or Revival, 2008. So his profile is really very interesting, extensive and um, our, our actually privileged to have him on uh, our page, uh, who's going to talk to our audience about his uh, uh, in-depth research in Manusmriti. Uh, Bharatji, before we start the main topic, I would like to tell us something about early years of your life and what did you do earlier? How did you get into this subject? Um, what kind of family background you have? So please tell us something about that. Well, thank you, Vaishali. Uh, I'm very happy to be uh, here with your hinduscriptures.com. Mane bahu saru lage che. I can manage a little Gujarati sometimes. So, Thank you. Well, there is nothing so special about my life. I come from a ordinary middle class family in Uttar Pradesh. My parents have, were involved in uh, the usual Vaishya karmas, that is uh, doing business. And uh, we, I was born in Muradabad. Then uh, in 1950, I came 
uh, to Delhi and took admission in an English uh, medium school, grew up there, I went to college in 1964, a very elite uh, college called St. Stephen's College in Delhi, did five years of literature, English literature. Then I went to US and Toronto, Canada, Toronto, to do some uh, PhD work, which I abandoned because I found uh, that in mid seventies, uh, America was not such an intellectually inspiring place for me. And I thought I should come back and seriously study my own tradition. I had some background in Sanskrit from childhood, a lot of background in music, classical Indian music from childhood in uh, Tulsi Krit Ramayan and uh, in Shakespeare because I went to an English medium school. So with all this uh, in 1972, when I started teaching in Delhi University, I went back uh, into a deep investigation of Indian classical texts, uh, the classical art of music, uh, the art of theater. And uh, then I continued my studies entirely on my own. And I thought that I should investigate very deeply the so-called Western tradition also. For that, I started learning uh, classical and modern Greek and uh, acquainted myself with that culture to see uh, the roots of so-called Western culture. And there I discovered that the ancient Greek civilization was not Western at all. It was as a matter of fact, uh, closer to India. It had much, much more to share with ancient India. So the ancient uh, Vedic and classical culture of India had a lot in common with the Homeric world, with the fifth century BC world. And I deeply studied these comparisons on my own uh, for 15 years. And I produced a work called Dramatic Concepts, Greek and Indian, which uh, was published in 94. Uh, it's a comparative study of ancient Greek and ancient Indian drama. It postulates that Greek drama is not at all Western. It is more Indo-European. It is closer to the Vedic uh, spirit and values. And I emphasized this. And then I made the distinction that what we call Western is actually the culture which developed uh, from 15th century onwards in Europe, uh, which uh, was known as the age of Renaissance. And it was this age of Renaissance that changed into the age of colonialism. And uh, then it dominated the cultures of Africa and Asia and India. I don't like to call uh, this part of the world as South Asia at all. It is the <laughs> India, larger India, India that influenced uh, China and Japan. And uh, then I have now been more involved with trying to see that what are some of the primary forces that divide culture and civilization, uh, let us say post 2000. Now, uh, this is the actually crux of my uh, investigation, my intellectual journey. And I think now that today the world is divided largely uh, into two camps. And my definition of these two camps is a little out of the way, or, and is perhaps also very, very traditional. I see that the world is divided on one side into those who are called worshippers of Murti, worshippers of Vigraha or idol or uh, things which are cosmic, the ancient cultures of Egypt, 
Greece, Africa, China, Japan, India, of course, the Vedic civilization. And on the other hand, uh, there are people who simply cannot tolerate the concept of uh, Murti, those who believe that uh, they have a tradition to follow emanating from Abraham. And it is the two streams that are in severe conflict today. They have been in conflict for 2000 years anyway, but are in very strong conflict today. They are known by different names today, like there is Christianity and Islam and Marxism. And now to that, we may add uh, this uh, new culture of wokeism, you know, the woke culture, which is again an extension of uh, the same intolerance. And they call everybody else intolerant and their whole history is uh, full of intolerance. They have a history of 2000 years of plunder, destruction of intolerance. And still they have the gumption to call others as intolerant. So they are on one side and the rest, the Murti Pujakas or those who worship God in form along with God beyond form, they are on the other side. So I think the world is divided into these two ideological camps today and uh, culture is to be seen in that perspective. That is so true, Bharaji. Uh, I think you have uh, very um, uh, smartly described uh, the, the present condition about the world and where it is going when it comes to culture. We, uh, as Indians, uh, we should know and we uh, must be proud of that, that we have a huge heritage of our scriptures and um, it goes thousands of years back and then it is still influencing in the same uh, ways. We still use lots of mantras from Rig Veda on various occasions. And we have principles uh, you know, in our personal life, which are described in Manusmruti as well. So I'm very glad that um, at least some influence is still there. So today's topic is Manusmruti. Uh, we have so many misconceptions. Today, you're going to have a little tough time because I'm going to ask you lots and lots of questions about misconception and how it can be clarified. So first, I think I would like to ask you, uh, first, let's make a presentation which you would like to say. And then based on that, I'll ask you that why there are so many misconceptions, misinterpretation, and why, uh, you know, how those things have come up in, in, uh, in, the, in, in you know, this as in, in our knowledge. Yeah, so please, uh, you may start uh, what you would like to say about Manus Pruti, uh, the features and why and what is the importance, how many shlokas, all that. Okay, now I have a difficult task before me, Vaishali, because I'm going to speak about Manus Pruti. I'm not going to say that I'm going to talk about the beautiful Manus Pruti, I'm not going to say that I am talking in defense of Manusmriti, but yeah. I would certainly like to say that uh, people simply don't know what Manusmriti is about. Sure, sure, sure. So I would talk about what exactly is the vision of Manusmriti and what it is about and how it is connected with the rest of Indian uh, civilizational or cultural values. So okay. let me begin first by saying that uh, in continuation of what I just said, that how the world is divided into two camps, you see the people who look upon uh, worshippers of murtis as infidels, kafirs, or heathens, and or even if they don't use such strong words, then they still think that there is something wrong uh, with such people. Like even the Indian Ari Samajis think that there's something wrong with those who worship Murtis and go to temples, you see. So there is this kind of attack, which became very prominent in India in the 19th century, uh, because the British uh, were people coming from Christian background. They had 2000 years of uh, Christian 
uh, intolerance with them. And uh, they assessed Indian culture that way. So they wanted to look for certain moral codes. Uh, what they would like, would have wanted to define as moral codes. Uh, or in other words, they were looking for a set of Hindu commandments, so to speak. You see that, okay, what is the injunction that God gave you, how to live, etc. Now, in India, it's not so simple <clears throat> because God does not give any instructions. And uh, creation is a far more complicated matter than just a set of injunctions. But anyway, they looked upon it that way and then they started searching for Hindu moral codes. And uh, as opposed to the Islamic moral codes, now it was easy uh, to find what was the Islamic moral code because the Holy Quran, the Hadith uh, is there, it's always been there. But for the Hindus, uh, they started looking for the Smritis and they landed upon Manusmriti. And they thought that if they just take up the Manusmriti as the Hindu moral code, and uh, then make some kind of a digest out of it and uh, use that as the basis of the Hindu law for administration of Hindus in the colonized India or the India which they were governing at that time, first as the East India Company and then as uh, uh, the followers of the crown. So they landed upon Manusmriti and they simplified the whole thing. And uh, apart from Manusmriti, the most difficult thing for uh, not just the British, but all Europeans, uh, when they came to the Indian subcontinent was to see the social structure of India. And for them, the simplest thing was to look upon it as what they call the caste system. And they simplified it and they said, okay, here is hierarchy. And the Hindus believe that creation is nothing but uh, a set of hierarchies. Brahma, Kshatriya, Vaishya, and Shudra. Now, as a matter of fact, if you look upon it, uh, this is not the Hindu prejudice at all. Because Manusmriti itself says that creation is Brahma and everybody is created as a part of Brahma and Brahma and then falls into the four categories on the basis of their profession. So it is the profession, it is the, uh, what may be called the Ajivika or the, the, uh, the way to make money or the economic order, which actually makes the hierarchy and which was called the Varana Dharma. And according to the Manusmriti and all other Smritis, not just Manusmriti, Varana is an economic order. It is primarily an economic order. It is something which, is a which gives a structure to the way the economics of the world runs. So the world doesn't run according to just economics. And Indian philosophies have a very complicated system. Uh, Sankhya would define it in a different way. Uh, they would say there is uh, Sattva, Rajas and Tamas, which defines Prakriti. And then they will talk about all different gradations and different variety. And uh, then there are so, other, so many other darshanas. We looked upon the cosmos and the attributes of the cosmos and creation in a very different manner. But uh, the colonialists, they just reduced it to the Varana Dharma or Varana or what was called in our text as Varana Ashram Dharma. And then they just defined it as caste hierarchy. And you know uh, that uh, Louis Dumont he even called uh, Hindu as homo hierarchicus, or that is the human beings who believe that hierarchy 
is intrinsic and essential to the nature of existence. So this was a prejudice which they carried. And then from that, everything in Manusmriti was equated to nothing but the four castes. And castigation of that caste was a very convenient thing to show that the Hindu was undemocratic, that the Hindu did not believe in freedom, that the Hindu did not believe in equality, because uh, they could always come up with their so-called enlightened values and uh, with uh, the uh, idea of Rousseau's equality, fraternity, and uh, uh, the third thing, you know. Uh, so they counterpoised it with Indian hierarchy. And they already had this prejudice that they have the white man's burden that God has chosen them to educate uh, the uncultured people. Now, this is, is essentially a Christian uh, prejudice, Abrahamic prejudice that uh, they are the chosen people. So the chosen people always come around and say that uh, we know the best. We know what is the truth. So sometimes uh, it is simple Christian doctrine as it was in the 19th century or right up to 19th century. But then of course it became socialism and Marxism when they said, well, this is the best for the world. Then ca comes capitalism, communist capitalism of China. So all these cultures, they come up with some rationale of theirs, which they say is the best because they are the chosen people who are going to uh, bring the order to rest of the world. So it's, it's just fundamentally the Christian prejudice. This kind of a prejudice did not exist in the Greek and the Roman mind or the so-called original civilizations of the Western world. Uh, so this is the primary reason for defining Manusmriti as a bad book as a book which is anti-democracy, as a book which does not believe in equality of men and women, uh, as a book which uh, intrinsically proves that there is a hierarchy and those at the top of the hierarchy, the Brahmins, they are to be blamed for perpetuating, first initiating and then perpetuating uh, a hierarchical system, an oppressive system in which the Brahmin is able to manipulate everything. So when you look at something very recent like Sheldon Pollock or Wendy Doniger, then the same prejudice comes in and, you know, Wendy Doniger said in her Hinduism that the uh, Brahmin can fix everything. You know, he has a cure for everything. He's supreme. Uh, I have, I have said this, I have shown how she has said this in one of my articles, which is available on the net. Long time back, it was put there about eight, nine years ago, soon after her book came out. So this prejudice somehow uh, perpetuates itself through now what is called the whole Indological setup or the Indological establishment of the West, namely uh, the universities of Europe and America and uh, the universities of India and Africa, which uh, kind of imitatively continue with this. So this is actually the background to the prejudice against Manusmriti. Now I, that I have given you what is wrong in our way of approaching Manusmriti, let me simply give you a very quick run through of what Manusmriti is about. Now, let me first begin by saying that Manusmriti is not unique. It is one of the almost 100 Smritis, big and small, but at least there are five or six, you know, Yagya Valk and Parashar and this and that, which are the dominant. So there were so many of them. 
but manusmriti has been considered as uh, the most eminent of them not just by uh, the british but even the traditional scholars so if you read through some of the commentaries of other smritis and smriti literature uh, medieval and ancient then you find that manu had perhaps the highest uh, status among the uh, among the writers of smritis so what is this text about now in a very typical way this text takes up certain things and gives a framework it consists of manusmriti in particular consists of 12 chapters you see it is not just caste system <laughs> that is only one chapter <laughs> that's only one one simple chapter you see but it has 12 chapters and if you look at the content of these and i'll quickly tell you about the first chapter is creation jagadutpatti and he says that knowledge is the reason veda is the reason of creation and the distinction between dharma and adharma is something that follows and then manusmriti goes on to say that creation comes into into effect according to karma karma anusara srishti creation is so whatever in creation appears as distinct and different from another category is on the basis of action karma you see the the philosophy of karma is is the fundamental philosophy of all indian systems not just vedic but the bauddha the jaina uh, and and every other system the tantric system karma is the most essential thing so they go on to define that these are some of the fundamental aspects of creation and creation is considered as something which is constantly renewed by yagya or sacrifice so the creator sacrifices himself to perpetuate yagya so yagya is the act of creation and the act of recreation and the act of sustaining the universe that is the not just an interpretation but that is the literal meaning defined of yagya in manusmriti then the second chapter this is dharma lakshan what is dharma now dharma here means that which sustains you dharayate iti dharma that which sustains the universe what are what are those forces what is that order so that order which in the vedic mantras is very often called as rit rit the the word term used for that is rit also that is the sustaining truth of the universe in practical ways for us it becomes as sanskar or ritual because through ritual we connect with the universe ritual is not just a set of uh inert actions or mumbo jumbo it is a highly conscious method of connecting with the universe of me as an individual come attuning oneself to this cosmos that is samskar so samskar is one of the most essential elements and then another element of creation is ved that is knowledge it is not just mantras of rig sam and yajush it is not that physical content of sound it is knowledge and then how that knowledge is contained and described in your memory that is smriti and that 
which sustains the universe is also good conduct or sadachar. And finally, atmatushti or inner happiness. Now we're not talking of, uh, you know, physical happiness of uh, having a retired life on beaches and hotels and consumerist culture. We are talking of atmatushti, that is the satisfaction of the deep uh, enlightenment of the self, contentment, self-contentment. So this is the second chapter. Then the third chapter talks about how one should lead a life of a grihastha. That is, one marries, one earns money. And it is at this point that your social responsibilities begin. You will be surprised to hear that Manusmriti says that the ashram of Grihastha is the highest. It is higher than the Brahmacharya. It is higher than the Vanaprastha. It is higher than the Sannyas. Because it sustains the other three. You produce wealth and you distribute that wealth to sustain education, the Brahmacharis, the Vanaprasthis, those who have withdrawn from the world and are thinking about deeper and artistic things, and finally the sannyasi. So the Grihastha Ashram is, is the most fantastic uh, responsibility. And it is in this Grihastha Ashram that you have to follow the five yagyas. And yagyas here is not just only the home, but it is five kind of yagyas. Brahma yagya, that is cultivation of knowledge. Pitri yagya, oblation to your ancestors and raising progeny and making them able citizens. Homa, that is sacrifice, puja, visiting temple later on. Then Bhuta yagya. That is caring for all other living beings and non-living beings. Create, uh, caring for all those birds, animals, reptiles, as well as stones, rivers, brooks, and mountains. Bhuta. So Bhuta Yagya means caring for all that. Today we, we talk, you know, now almost mechanically about environment and taking care of the environment. But... Manu says that this is one of your major responsibilities. Out of the five yagyas, bhuta yagya is that. And finally, yagya or oblations or a giving or charity towards fellow human beings. So you see, this is how Manu Smriti talked about the responsibilities. And as you can see, these are very different values from modern cultures. Modern cultures, rightly or wrongly, whether in India or in Europe or in America or, you know, South America, are all consumerist cultures today. Even Hinduism has become a highly consumerist culture and we are caught up in this uh, whole web of consumerism. Now, Manusmriti has an entirely opposite vision to it. Manusmriti is talking about the whole. It's talking about the cosmos. It is talking about how the individual and the human being is placed within cosmos. And it does not talk about man as the center of the universe. The vision of Vedas, the vision of Manu, and the vision of all great Indian, Indian seers is not anthropocentric. It does not concentrate on man. It concentrates on creation. And in the Indian philosophies, creation and creator are same. They are two sides of the same coin. It's not like the Abrahamic God who is the creator and for whom creation is inferior. So 
in the Hindu system or in the Indian system or in the uh, Shak Darshanas or all the Darshanas of India, creation is the cosmos. And the individual has to find her, his small place within the cosmos. And that place is not small in the sense of physicality, but it is crucial because it is one with the universe. So as there is only belief in one, the individual is the same as the larger universe. It is all one. So Manuspriti talks about that concentration on the whole, the cosmos. What is at the center of Manu is not this, uh, you know, simple, silly classification of Varna, Brahma, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra, and we are now neurotically going on and on talking about that only, and we have reduced the whole Manusmriti to that. So I think this is just uh, political propaganda, and we know where it comes from, and I have said so. So I would like people to reread Manusmriti and see the big vision. And then they talk about, in the fifth chapter, about purity or shauj. Now, purity does not mean that certain things you will touch and certain things you will not touch. That is part of the practical conduct, but the real purity, as Manusmriti says and very clearly says, is economic purity. How do you earn your living? Artha shuchi. Artha. Artha means how you make your living, how you acquire wealth, how you acquire money. And Manusmriti says that of all the uh, of all the shuchis, of all the purities, the most important is Artha shuchi. And Manusmriti in the fifth chapter says the Sarvesham Shauchana Artha Shaucham Param Smritam of all the ways of acquiring purity, sarvesham, of all the ways, shaucanam, artha shaucham param smitam. Purity of artha, economic purity, acquiring wealth is the most important. Yo arthe shuchihi, hisa shuchihi. Purity is purity of artha. That is the real shuchi, not the, shu not the shuchi or not the purity that you get by uh, taking a bath or rubbing yourself with uh, other things to clean yourself. So this, this is a very clear verse, 106 verse in the fifth chapter. So you can see that the vision of Manusmriti is uh, a very wide cosmic vision of things. It's not related to some small uh, hierarchical issue only. The sixth chapter talks about how one should retire from life. Now you see, we all the time talk in the context of Smritis and Manusmriti. We all the time endlessly neurotically go on talking about Varna. But all the Smritis talk not of Varana only. They always talk of Varana Asha. So the ideal is that while you have the four Varanas, you also have the four Ashramas. And human life is to be led in four stages, broadly speaking. Brahmacharya, Grahastha, Vanaprastha, and Sanyas. So that means that you are going to acquire wealth in one stage. But you are going to give and sustain the other three. And then you are going to come out of it. So the idea of giving up. You see, the fundamental value of Manusmriti is Dhan, giving. And this is in direct contrast to the modern value of 
acquiring, taking, demanding. So we live in a world of demands, rights, what we call today rights. So all kinds of rights, child right, women right, uh, this right, that right, endless number of rights, which are all demand first and demand as a person of different kind. Manusmriti starts the other way. It says the fundamental thing is to give. So when it talks of five yagyas, it says this, these are the five ways in which you have to give. When it talks of sacrifice or yagya, yagya means fundamentally giving. So whether you give in the temple when you do puja or whether you do yagya when you give oblations to fire, the whole paradigm, the whole conduct is for giving. The fundamental value is that you have to give, not acquire. You of course acquire, but first you give and then that comes back to you as a consequence of your karma of giving. So it's an exactly opposite notion of life from the modern consumerist values. And we as Indians, we as uh, people who develop the Shaddarshanas and various other philosophies must now understand this and understand it for good. Manusmriti also talks about Raja Dharma, that is how a king should govern. Manusmriti has long chapters on what is uh, uh, what are property rights and what is going to be the procedure in courts. And Manusmriti is very emphatic upon evidence. And any kind of false evidence is considered to be a great crime. Today, false evidence is on what the modern system of law rests. You can get away from law by false evidence and nobody thinks twice about it. But for Manu, that was a cardinal sin and all kinds of punishments were prescribed. Then it talks about man-woman relationship. Then it talks about how certain consequences follow if you break the social order. And the last two chapters, 11th and 12th, Manusmriti talk about conduct. That a human being's life is made by his acharana or conduct. So again, the doctrine of karma. You see, karma becomes again and again the pivotal action. And the last chapter goes into a philosophic flight and says that what is ultimately good for man. By man, of course, we mean men and women. And according to Manu, even the third gender, because uh, the ancient text did not consider third gender as something unnatural or something uh, not made by God. So this is now the vision of Manusmriti. And the question is, uh, of course, that calls for a separate lecture by itself. But the question is, how can we benefit by it today? So there are many things that we can look upon in terms of values, in terms of practical actions, and we can revive those things in the modern context. For instance, you can simply revive the value of evidence in courts today. And you, I mean, we, we have a law of perjury, but nobody takes it seriously. Nobody implements it. So if you want to take some benefit from Manu, then give it the due importance. And there are so many other things that I can talk about, but primarily, as I said, that we have to see the values. We have to see what is fundamentally prescribed to us as a vision, what man lives for. And the whole idea of dharma, artha, kam, the three purusharthas, later on called the four purusharthas, dharma, kam, moksha, how they are put into a meaningful life and how there is a balance. Manusmriti talks 
above all in balancing things, balancing personal desires against universal demands and universal obligation, dharma. Dharma is basically karma which gives us the right to the right to enjoy. So you don't have the right to enjoy by demanding it to somebody from somebody else, but only by performing the right karma. So it's a philosophy based upon responsibility. And responsibility with uh, with an awareness and in and in the limitations of human action and how a uh, human being should not transgress, how they should not uh, create an imbalance or break things by their greed, by their acquisitional desires, and how they should uh, how they should create a balance looking at the larger truth of cosmos. Yes, yeah. that, that is the fundamental notion. Bharatji, such a wonderful explanation of Manusmriti. I, I, I have no words to explain my joy because I was really looking for an answer to so many questions. I think initially what you described about the world and how it got changed, it has uh, answered many of my questions already. But then coming uh, down to certain specific things which I had read in the newspaper where they had quoted Manusmriti in the wrong context. So I wanted to ask you those things. And I think they were famously discussed within India as well, as in, you know, they were talking about like, for example, rights to women, because yeah. nowadays feminist women are using this or abusing this text in such a way that they are trying to tell us uh, that even our scriptures are uh, not uh, kind of in favor of women or they don't give enough right to women. So what would you like to say about this? Hey. Uh, we have to, first of all, make a distinction between post-industrial and pre-industrial societies. And once you look upon that, you will get an answer to many kinds of disparities that have come into existence and many kinds of social orders which are post-industrial. Okay. Regarding women, from childhood, I've been hearing that uh, because women cannot go to work, because women cannot own personal property, because they cannot rise to be, let's say, a fighter pl a plane pilot or, uh, you know, principal of a university uh, college or vice chancellor of a university. So there is immense inequality. Now, one has to understand that this is the demand of a social economic order, which is post-industrial. You see, this kind of a demand never existed. It's not in the pre-industrial world. It's not as if women in Europe or, uh, or anywhere in the world were idle, that they did not produce, or they did not have control, or they uh, were not uh, uh, you know, running the show at all, uh, they were all the time oppressed. It's not, that's not the truth simply. When we talk about in modern times, how women are not allowed to cross the, you know, what is that called the, the glass ceiling, then we are really talking about giving the same number of jobs or sufficient number of jobs to men sorry, to women, which men have. Now, I'll put it in a different way. What you are asking today is that in an industrial society or even in a post-industrial society, which has instead of the, uh, instead of the mechanical machine, you have the computer before you. What you are asking for is that women should be finally given the same kind of slavery from 10 to 5 or 
you know, 15 hours out of 24, they should be subjected to the same slavery that men are subjected to. I mean, I look upon this thing, you may call me a cynic, you may call me, uh, you know, even more male chauvinist or whatever you like. But to me, all this demand is the demand of modern industrial or even post-industrial productive society, consumerist society, that you want women to go to work, travel two hours, travel back two hours, work there for eight hours, everything. So what you're doing really is putting them to the same slavery that you have put men to. This is how I look upon it. And then you classify the whole ancient world as somebody which did not allow women to take control of things the same way that men did. I think Manusmriti or other civilizations, the ancient Greek civilization or Egyptian civilization, they made a distinction between men and women that there are certain things that men are better equipped for and they can do better. And there are certain things that women are better for and they can do better. Now we have stopped that distinction, you see. Uh, right now in the 21st century, we don't even want to talk about uh, gender disparity. We want to talk about gender uniformity we want to talk about a fluid gender. You see, we have reached that point where we don't want to make a distinction between men and women at all. And I think this is something absolutely uh, unreal, unnatural. So I would put it this way, Manusmriti or pre-industrial societies had a definition for role of women under the conditions of pre-industrial economies, namely in which productivity for women was primarily around home. Now in post-industrial society or uh, contemporary, let us say digitized society, you would have different roles. You would have different roles, productive roles, both for men and women. And I think women should be given those roles and they should be given a priority to manage those roles in which they can do much better. And I personally believe that if women can have for centuries or you know, why centuries for millions of years uh, managed home in the sense that they are the fulcrum of procreation, of raising uh, the children, if they are the fulcrum of uh, the center where not just procreation but then creation and flowering is, then they can be given those roles more. So I think there should be more women legislators, I think there should be more uh, women, not just nurses and doctors, but those who can think about the wellness of medical wellness of society. Those roles should be given in larger numbers to women. And I think if we prioritize it this way, then we'll have a more productive society. You have to redefine roles according to the contemporary technology. You see, when a new technology comes, it redefines the roles uh, in a society. When we lived in a pre-print culture, then we had one kind of society, manuscript society. Then we had a print culture. Now, after the print culture, we have the television and the digital culture. So our society has changed. Now this whole business of going to office for eight hours, working there, all this is undergoing a serious change. And uh, uh, mark my words, this is going to change the economic order radically in coming years. So let's think of future and let us also think how women can do certain things much better than men can do. And uh, I have no qualms in admitting 
that they can do several things much better than men. That is so true. That is so true. Uh, I'm so happy and I'm so glad that you clarified so many things which I have been thinking for all these years because I'm not a feminist at all. I don't believe that making money is the only way to make a woman successful. I mean, that cannot be the only parameter for any woman to call herself successful or uh, accomplished. So, exactly. Uh, it's not even male that's not a parameter for a male either yeah exactly you see, first you first you create this perversion about men that right. making money getting power dominating others is the way to success and then you say why are not women doing the same same exactly i totally agree with you Right. That is not the right parameters. Because, and I also think that women at home, they have much more to control, uh, 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 you know, to put her efforts and brain into a lot of things. We just see our kitchen, like we have, if you have to cook four times a day with so many ingredients and so many thousands of recipes. And if our women are able to do it for so many years and so successfully, that means their brain is uh, working much more than men. You see, uh, it, if you look at ancient societies, it's not just cooking or managing home. Sure. And in modern times, the definition of home or the parameters of the home have exploded. They are much larger. Sure. You see, they cover so many social institutions as well. So that is also eco, you know, home. Because uh, what is economics? Let me give you a, a small uh, acquaintance with the original word, the Greek word. E ecos means home. Mm. Running the home is economia or economics. Mm. That's the original meaning of economics. But it is not home is not just where you live. Home yeah. is society as a whole. True, true. And so managing society as a whole managing the whole uh, structure of society is also something which women can do and women can do very well but you cannot make give them the stereotype you know copy the stereotypes that you have prescribed for men very true that is so nicely put uh, there are a couple of things which were mentioned about remuneration to women. So is there any reference given in Manuspruti that how women should be paid in case if they were supposed to get paid uh, anywhere? Because this also I found in one of the controversial, um, you know, statement done by somebody. Look, you see the question of pay or vetana. Vetan, yeah. Uh, this was there in ancient societies. But in ancient societies, people had economic control or many things were given back to them, not just by salaries. You see, mm. ancient societies, ancient Indian society was not a bureaucratic society. It's only the bureaucrats who were given vetan. Right. And it was only a certain small class who were given. The other people, they were in a relationship, not just men and women, but men, women, children, or a class, as a whole class of people, they were in a relationship of dependence on mm. others. Or what was called the, the Yajman Purohit relationship. So sure. this is something which applied to various sections of society. Like a Brahmin was dependent upon a Kshatriya and a Vaishya, oh. not for salary, but for economic benefits. Benefits, true. They would give him, and they would, they had to give him. They, it was compulsory for them to give dan to a Brahmin. Yeah. And Very similarly, true. it was compulsory for them to pay, not monthly, but throughout their life to the dependents who served them, you know, the servants, those who provided the menial services, 
or who provided the goods or who sold things. So it was a relationship of economic order in which you had lifelong relationships. The uh, salary business was in a small section of society. Like uh, some bureaucrats would get paid and uh, you can, uh, you have references about that and you have mentioned of Raj Mahal when they have those uh, people walking in in a very different manner. And, oh. and I have seen this kind of an order operate, uh, let's say 60 years ago in my childhood. Mm. I, I, I have memories of uh, 10 years of age when I saw this order being operated. Sure. When the, those dependent on our family, they had to be given. And it was not only the Shudras, so-called Shudras who were dependent. But the Brahmins were also dependent. Sure. So where the question comes of Brahmins uh, controlling and suppressing others, which is very, very weird uh, statement to make. And we have been hearing that ek poor, uh, ek gari Brahman tha. Any story, even those uh, Dant Katha Jisko Gehte Hai, it used to start with this in Hindi. Even in Gujarati, it was the same. So yeah. where is, the, where, how this concept of Brahmin suppressing others came? If I think I would like you to describe something here. You, if you read about the life of Brahmins, hmm. how they were supposed to lead their lives. Hmm. There is one word which describes it in English, and that is austerity. True. They had to live in utter simplicity. They could not wear gold. Oh. Yes, they could not accept in here. And very few Brahmins ever had any gold to wear. Those who were practicing Vedic rituals, they could not keep uh, even food in their house, which could be used beyond three days or four days. They had oh. to daily bhiksha. Mm. They were totally dependent on bhiksha. So then maybe with, uh, with all the restrictions, they had to take a bath five times a day or six times a day. They had to dress very simply. They were not allowed to wear silk. They were mm. not to ride a horse or a carriage. They could only carry their personal umbrella. So it was an entirely a life of austerity. Now the image that has been created in our minds about Brahmin is that there was this very wily uh, <laughs> Brahmin who had the Kshatriya under his total spell. <laughs> and you know, the Kshatriya do this, do this, or who told people that if you don't do this, then uh, such and such calamity would befall you. Yeah. We have created this whole image of the Brahmin, which is unhistorical, which is not found in any text. All the texts are describing most Brahmins were more like Sudamas. True. True. The majority of them. Then, they were, they were compelled to spend their life in study mm. and teaching. Now, because there was such a huge class of Brahmins teaching that India was able to preserve knowledge. So we have, we have simply not paid attention to the great feats of learning which were largely done by the Brahmin Varga or the Brahmin Varana. How could you preserve knowledge? It's not, you see, there were various kinds of skills which were preserved by all people, like skills of war, skills of uh, merchandise, business. They were preserved by people of belonging to uh, different categories and different Varanas. But then, those who categorized knowledge, those who classified knowledge, those who prepared the manuscripts and transmitted it all over the country, they were Brahmins. And their role in transmission of knowledge was very practically there. It was not an 
adoration. It was not something like uh, the right. You see, most of the <coughs> most of the vices which are attributed to Brahmins were actually the vices of the church. If you look at history, that the church had its own army. The church had its own revenue. The church was a power by itself for 1500, almost uh, 1200 years. And the whole history of Europe is a fight of the people against the church. Now, where was this Brahminical church in India? All the Brahmins were dependent upon bhiksha patronage. And there were Brahmins who even wrote Sanskrit, uh, as, as Sanskrit uh, verses in praise of all kinds of rulers, including some highly oppressive and tyrannical Muslim rulers. Because out of the Brahmins, there were people who would misuse knowledge, who would sell knowledge also. It's not as if every Brahmin was uh, practicing the highest conduct. There were plenty of Brahmins who, who did rather mean things. But the average Brahmin was the one who practiced the, the profession of learning with great dedication and great success. India was a knowledge-based society. Otherwise, how could India be a prosperous society for thousands of years? You don't have to give a proof of India being a prosperous society to anybody. Sure. If people were coming to loot and plunder it for thousands of years, then they were coming here to plunder wealth, not take away the poverty of India. <laughs> Very true. So there is another uh, another definition of shudra, which is uh, highly um, misquoted by lots of people. So what Manu Smriti has to say about the so-called shudra community or the category of people? Shudra category means that those who work by hand. So all kinds of skilled workers who are working through an in a pre-industrial society, that was the only way of production. You see, there was there were no machines there. So obviously everybody had to work through hands. So people who produced different uh, uh, different objects, so all the artisans. Yeah. All the creators of different skills, those who made swords, those who made weapons, those who made pottery, no matter what, the whole production of was done. What is done today by machines or by computers was done by hands and brains, of course, and skills of the people who use their hand. Now, these were Shudra. So we have actually equated Shudra with the Chandal or with the outcast, the untouchable. So we think that one third of the population of ancient India was untouchable. You see, all this whole, all this, uh, uh, what should I say, this kind of a chimera that has mm -hmm. been generated about ancient India, medieval India is totally false. And it is a picture which was created from 18th century onwards by the Christian missionaries to denigrate India as a civilization. And sure. it was sold to us. And then after independence, it was perpetuated by none other than Sri Jawaharlal Nehru and his socialism yes. and the Marxist. Yes. So yeah, it's essentially a political it says political theory, it's not historical. You, you can't go to text and see this. Or if, you, if you read the text, whether they're literary text or philosophical text, not so much philosophical, but let us say Shastras uh, pertaining to different, uh, uh, different skills, different arts, 
then you see an entirely different picture. Okay, so one more question I have in my mind is that in Manusmriti, it uh, as in someone has quoted this that Manusmriti Manusmriti says that in a war when a king has lost, um, yep. another king who has won is allowed to take away his wife and then uh, you know keep her because this was happening by Mughals and now they have uh, kind of justified by saying that even Manusmriti says the same thing and this I've heard okay. from someone. Very very close to me because she studied that thing while studying Sanskrit in one of the university, and this is being taught in Sanskrit in universities in India. Well, I'll be very happy if that person or any other person, for that matter, any other scholar from India or <laughs> Europe or America, is able to give me a quotation from not only Manusmriti, but any other Smriti. That, uh, the, that, that a conquering king could take men, women, and children as slaves. Now, let me tell you something very simply. On the contrary, not only Manusmriti, but all Smritis say unequivocally. I don't have time today, otherwise I would have read out the quotations just as I read one quotations, quotation to you. It says explicitly that a conquering king, when he enters the, uh, the city, that is the Rajadhani, excuse me, when he enters the capital, then he tells all the conquered people do not fear. <laughs> it gives Abhay. And Manusmriti says he has a right, he has no right to touch anybody. Brahman, Khatriya, Vaishya or Shudra. He has no right to touch anybody. He can only touch the Rajkosh, that is the royal treasury. He can take the wealth of the Khatriyas whom he has vanquished in battle, but he cannot touch their women or children. I mean, I'm amazed. Can you give me a quotation from uh, Valmiki, Ramayana, Mahabharata, or later uh, texts uh, from uh, classical uh, dramas or from Banabhatta or from any other, uh, you know, Katha, Sarit Sagar, all these Puranas, can you give me a quotation where it is said that such and such king, when he came back, he brought with him so many thousand women slaves or men slaves or children as slaves. Now we see this in the literature of Greece. If you read Homer, if you read Euripides, if you read Ischylus, you, you find the whole thing explicitly there. It was part of the institutions of Greeks and Egyptians to conquer, take slaves of the population. But we do not find such reference anywhere in Indian texts. We do find that some women became dependent, you know, that some women were given a place to live, but we, but there were no Dasas won in a battle. So there was nobody called Yuddha Dasa. <laughs> right. True. There is no such category that I conquered him in the battle. The Holy Quran talks about how you have a right to take the conquered women and make them slaves. Exactly. That is the reason I'm asking you this question because I know this is discussed by lots and lots of people. So people are now kind of uh, projecting their own sins mm -hmm. into the past of the uh, Indians. True. Now we had slavery. I'm not going to argue that there was no slavery, but we had economic slaves. People who became slaves because they sold themselves for some reason or the other. 
So there was slavery. Was it there? And, and we In know that. Of course, of course, there was there, there was economic slavery. People were made into slaves because they sold themselves into slave for various reasons. So okay. then they they were kept as slaves. Their children were uh, those who were born to them in slavery. They grew up to be slaves, and at some point they were. Uh, either continue they continued as slaves or they were uh, set free really? but mm -hmm. so there was this kind of economic slavery but not from war war prisoners were not taken slavery okay so my no, one uh, that, last the, yeah let me say one thing maybe it's a joke but if uh, this was in indian tradition of taking war slaves the 94,000 soldiers of Pakistan who were captured in 1972, they would have been kept as war prisoners and war slaves in Hindu India. Yeah, <laughs> that is so we, true. After feeding them biryani for months and months. That is so true. So my yeah. last question about Manusmriti is that, um, is there any mention about uh, Swarg or at, uh, Atma or uh, salvation or nirvana in Manusprati because this is also misquoted uh, with reference of Manusprati. No, no, the last chapter of Manusmriti, Shubha Shubha Vivek, is about that only. Okay. But what so, does it what, It's It is about spiritual elevation. It is about hmm. Atma Tushti. It is about raising yourself above worldly concerns. Mm. Because once you become one prast, that is what you pursue. The whole uh, ideal of Indian life was that your efforts are to be divided into four categories, avastha, four mm. stages of life. So the, sec the third and the fourth, you were taught to give up. First, learn then earn, then withdraw, and finally give up. So these were the four stages of life, and I think they were practiced uh, up to a fair degree. Of course, human beings practice their ideals uh, only partially, and so did the Indians, but I think they, they damn well did it. They did it. Uh, Bharaji, I'm so glad that you explained so many things about Manusprati such, in such a, um, you know, very accurate and very compact way because I really have no words to say that it was such a wonderful, uh, you know, experience to have this conversation with you because there are so many such doubts and misconceptions which are being created by the media and the lefties and the, those who are anti-India and who are uh, still promoting Manusprudhi as uh, the text for all these, you know, various wrong reasons. Uh, my last question to you is which Manusprudhi, because I've heard that there are many versions which are available and because of this, this you know, this is happening. So which Manusprudhi one should refer by published by whom? Uh, give us some idea about that. Uh, I have been using the text published by Motilal Banarsi Das. Right. And uh, I will show you the first page, you know, of that. And, uh, you know, this is, this is the page that I use. Mm. This is the text. This is the original uh, Sanskrit text with uh, a commentary of Kuruk Bhatta, which is a medieval commentary. And I think this is a fairly good uh, edition. Now, here it's important to say one thing. You see, variety of editions is there. But that is something which is meant for deep scholars. Okay. You know, whether a particular verse is found in one place or in another. But the 12 chapters that I have described and their, and their broad content is there in every edition. 
Now, what okay. matters is these 12 chapters and the values and the ideas which are there. So this whole business about which edition and is it a true edition? Did the yeah. British concoct it? This is all to derail us from the real thing. Okay. And we use this kind of a devious method of uh, sabotaging the study of our text, not just for Manusmriti, we do it for Puranas, we do it for uh, Natya so Shastras, for lots of texts, for, for Bhagavad Gita. So I'm talking of the fundamentals. Let's get our fundamentals first. That is they are true. so clear. They are so well repeated. And they are mentioned not in one, but in hundreds of texts. India has a whole wealth of texts even after uh, it faced a destruction of millions of its texts. So you can imagine how much would have been produced and it is not some kind of a uh, worship to say this. This is all historical. That is so true. Thank you, Bharaji. Thank you so much for having this, uh, you know, giving us this gyan and giving us this enlightenment about Manuspruti. I'm so happy. I think I'll, uh, you, you are one of those very few speakers who would like, whose uh, speech I would like to hear again and again. Like I'll be seeing our conversation again just to learn more about Manusruti, because of course, in one shot, I can't remember everything what you said. And I'm so happy that, you know, you described it so well. I mean, not a single word was out of context. And that is what I like because, but I think that comes with experience. Like I could derail and I take time to find the right words, but I think your language and the uh, words you used were so precise and so perfect that I have no, nothing else to say. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you very you. much. And it was a great experience for me to be on your channel. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Namaste.